Our little demon is finally becoming a D-man. King has unlocked his powers, y'all. And not only are they adorable, they're also pretty epic. Today, we're looking back at Knock Knock Knockin' on Hootie's door to recap what we've learned about demons and theorize what's next for King's powers. You're watching Whitney Vision, and this is why King's powers might be more than meets the eye. Real quick before we get started, I want to remind everyone that you can help support Whitney Vision as we grow our numbers back by donating to our Patreon. We've got stickers and more, so see if any of our donation tiers work for you. Now on to King's powers! I've been wondering since season one when and if King was gonna start doing magic of his own, and I'm so excited that our boy finally leveled up. I can empathize with the little dude's search for his greater purpose, and it's really rad to see him slowly find the answers he's looking for. And who better to help him navigate demon puberty than the demonic core of the Owl House himself, Hootie. Professor Hootie explains the different types of demons and their exclusive powers in hopes of triggering a magical reaction in King. After kidnapping him via owl pellet and setting up a lecture for Demon Puberty 101.5, Hootsifer begins teaching. Although the King of Demons once boasted his vast knowledge of the subject, it's clear that our boy has a lot to catch up on. According to Hootie, there are eight different defining traits for demons. Fur, Chinchilla, Pocket Monster, Cthulhu, Fidgety, Claws, Cartoon, and Super Cute. Clearly, King is not a Cthulhu, but the rest are fair game. Even Hootie's not sure if King is a Chinchilla or a Cubone. Hootie relays that their demonic ancestors arose from the muck of a decomposing titan, and all demons can be placed in one of three main categories – bugs, bipeds, or beasts. First, Hootie tests King to see if he's a bug type, even though he's pretty sure he isn't. Just look at those little paws! Although, if you look at some of the examples on the board, you'll see that the representative from the stylist coven, aka the baby class teacher, is marked with a sticky note that says hybrid. My guess is that this demon is a mix between bug and biped types. Other bug demons include Adagast, the puppeteer from Season 1, Episode 2, a Flutterbug, the bear trap demon that many of you kindly pointed out was in Season 1, a devilish head with fairy wings, winged eyeballs, what looks like a tan-colored roly-poly, an eyeball spider, a pink slug, and that big guy with the unsettling face who carries smaller demons in his tummy. But bugs communicate with one another via dance, so the first challenge is seeing if King can talk to his fellow demons by shaking his groove thing. The two bug demons that demonstrate their abilities are a fairy and a double-bodied flutterbug, and although they perform a poetic repertoire, King's Boogie accidentally insults Hootie's mother. Bug demons are also able to form a small amount of magic, even though they don't have bile ducts. After failing to spin a cocoon properly, Hootie declares that King is not a bug type. Next, Hootie tests King to see if he's a biped, which makes sense because King does tend to walk on two legs instead of all four. Like witches, biped demons have magic bile ducts and pointed ears, and they're also able to perform spells. Some examples of these kinds of demons include Tibbles, Eileen, Selene, Warden Wrath and Braxis, the Animal Control Guy, Goblins, the Spiky-Headed Abomination Student, the Cute Bat Girl from the Plant Track, the Beak-Faced Witch from the Oracle Track that I think has a crush on Willow, the Ugnot Kid from the Beast Keeping Track, and of course, Tiny Nose. Don't underestimate Dana's self-insert character, man. She might look like she's intensely playing Animal Crossing, but she's a fierce fighter. She takes King down with a single move, and it's clear that our little dude cannot hang with the bipeds. Side quest? Is Baby Girl still using those power glyphs from the construction coven? Or has she just gotten a billion times stronger? She did graduate from medical school, though, so we know she's a smarty pants. Lastly, Hoodie tests King to see if he's a beast demon. Only a blood sample can truly confirm whether or not a demon is beast type, but it seems like a safe guess because most of them closely resemble animals like this furry baby. Some common beast demons include echo mice, rat worms, selkie domuses, slither beasts, snagglebacks, trash slugs, spider lions, the owl beast, and of course the extremely terrifying and incredibly rare giraffe. Unfortunately for King, however, the blood test came back inconclusive, so Hootie can't figure out exactly what he is. At first, King is pretty disappointed. The only reason that he went through with all these ridiculous, moderately dangerous tests in the first place was to find out more about where he came from. He thought that maybe if he could figure out what he is, it might lead him to finding out who he is, or even who his father might be. But just as he starts to freak out at the unfairness of it all, he lets out a sonic woof that radiates a powerful ring of energy throughout the night sky. Although King isn't mad at Hootie, he's experiencing a lot of emotions towards his father for abandoning him and leaving him without any explanation about where he came from. He specifically says that he's mad at his dad, but because I'm the queen of daddy issues, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. That anger is based in immense sadness. As my therapist likes to remind me frequently, anger is a secondary emotion, meaning that there are usually other feelings lying underneath that cause the anger to bubble up. 
For example, someone might get angry because they're embarrassed, because they're hurting, or because they're scared. The primary emotions in those cases would be the shame, the pain, and the fear. And the person experiencing them might get angry because they don't have coping mechanisms for those feelings. In this situation, King is feeling hurt, abandoned, confused, and frustrated, causing him to react angrily. When he lashes out, his scream produces a ring of power that radiates outward, hitting Hootie. Later on, when a giant chunk of the Owl House threatens to crush Luz before she can even ask out Amity, King lets out another mighty bork with multiple power rings that explode the rock into a sea of perfect lesbian flag lighting. And when he gets home for the evening, he practices using it on smaller objects, like one of Ida's apple blood glasses. Later on, when he and Amity are battling against Hunter to protect the portal key in Eclipse Lake, King lets out a tiny sonic bork that blows the Golden Guard's hair back but it isn't really powerful enough to do much else. This tells me that King's powers are stronger when he's impassioned, like he was when he was upset with Hootie, or scared that his friends would be squished. Before he can make another sound, he gets toppled during the fight and lands upside down with his horn stuck in the Titan's veins. I'm kinda like, dude, even if you're inverted, you can still help. But he's a cute, sweet little baby, not a warrior, so it's okay. My question, and I'm sure King's question as well is, what kind of powers does King's dad have? And will King grow into them as he gets stronger? Personally, I'm hoping that King becomes the Owl House's furry little black canary. If he can find a way to make his sonic borks more powerful, he could do some serious damage to the Emperor's Coven with a single woof. And if we're doing black canary rolls, maybe he'll also be able to propel himself around the boiling aisles with his screams. Unfortunately, stopping King's new power will be pretty easy for Bellos' cronies, because pretty much all they'd have to do is tie a gag in his mouth to prevent him from making noise. Kinda similar to how the guards just stuffed earplugs in when the Bards Against the Throne showed up at the marketplace. And speaking of the Bard Coven, they might be the ones to talk to about King's new sound-related powers. If anybody knows how to train King to use his voice magic, it's that group. Ugh, if only Rain wasn't trapped by the Emperor's Coven, they could be doing vocal warm-ups and strength training exercises right now! Obviously, King hasn't used his sonic bork in a musical setting yet, but the muscle has to be similar, right? One of the reasons why musical spells are so powerful, in my opinion, are because of the emotions that their melodies stir up. For example, remember when Ida and Rain were playing their Rhapsodies and Requiems? Their magic wasn't only physically powerful. There were also so many feelings behind the song they played together, including infatuation, heartbreak, concern, forgiveness, and even fear. This got me thinking about King's powers, and the way that emotion might be tied to them as well. This is definitely just a theory at this point, but what if King's new magic roar has the power to influence, heighten, or manipulate the emotions of others? Obviously, this theory stems from the first time we see King display his powers as it appears to alter Hootie as if he was put under a curse. Immediately after this outburst, Hootie says that he feels sad now too. Obviously, Hootie could just be saying this because he empathizes with his friend's need to belong and it's digging up some of his own feelings of inadequacy. But what if King's magic actually caused Hootie to absorb some of his negative feelings? Hootie is definitely always a pretty dramatic guy, but he really freaks out after being rejected by King. Every time we see Hootsifer after this moment, he gets increasingly more upset. The only exception is the dream Hootie that appears to Ida, but dream is the operative word there. When she wakes up as Harpy Ida, real Hootie is already distraught and breaks easily into a big sob. Then when he checks on Luz, he's not crying, but clearly he's struggling with dopamine. He's able to compose himself, but the next time he shows up, he's having a full-scale meltdown. Okay, but Whitney wasn't tiny nose with Hootie when King unleashed his pulse of sadness. She wasn't affected at all. That is a great point, dear viewer, but tiny nose wasn't actually hit by the blast. If you rewatch the scene, her cake shields her. It explodes, but the wave doesn't pass through it. The same happens when King battles Hunter. When the blast radiates towards Hunter, Lil Rascal swoops in to absorb the blow and dissipate the wave around Hunter. As for Little Rascal, they're either immune to the emotional effects because of the magical aura they were exuding, or any direct effects were unnoticeable because they had transformed into a staff. Those are the only times King has hit living organisms so far, but let's also examine him rescuing Lumity. As King witnesses Luz and Amity about to be squished by debris, he's feeling a combination of fear, protectiveness, and love towards his friends. Interestingly, after his magic causes the stone to explode, pink, orange, and white floating lights appear, and both Luz and Amity start to blush once again. And again, I know, I know, maybe they're just blushing because that's what these two always do. But what if King's love translated into that spell, causing both of them to feel it in the air around them? Remember when Ida and Rain were performing their song together? Those floating lights appeared then too. And when Bat starts playing their first tune together at the marketplace, it creates an effervescent cloud of song and light that passes over the crowd, 
causing objects to float and faces to smile. Is it possible that these sounds were creating tangible feel-good vibes that others could actually experience? To be clear, I'm not saying Lumity is a thing because of a spell cast by King, but he might have set the mood. Like I said, this is just a silly theory, so there are definitely some holes. For example, when King blasts through those apple blood glasses, or when he tries to use echolocation to find the titan's veins, there aren't really any emotional-based side effects there. But they didn't hit any organic matter, so who's to say that they wouldn't have? Perhaps that's why King's echolocation had such lackluster results, too. Obviously, it could just be that echolocation isn't in King's toolbox, but let's indulge the theory a little here. Echolocation isn't something King is biologically primed to utilize. He doesn't even have visible ears. Actually, nothing about King's character design screams, well, screaming. So maybe his powers aren't solely sonic in nature, they're just manifesting through his voice as he grows into them. Sonic or not, if King is able to alter or heighten emotions, what does that mean for the future of the series? Well, practically, it might mean that he'll be able to rally the bad girl coven when they're put into dire straits and inspire them to push past a moment of low morale. He could also amplify their magic if they need a strength boost. Based on the murals in King's old castle, it seems his species is somehow a counterpart to Titans. So part of me even wonders if he can create some sort of magic battery bubble that'll let glyphs work in the human realm without the need for a Titan's corpse. Said mural does imply that whatever King has yet to unlock will be a key for overcoming the ultimate baddie of the show. Those are just some of my thoughts on King's new powers, but I want to know what you guys think in the comments. What other powers do you think King might develop? What do you think his sonic barks mean about his dad? Let me know down below, like and subscribe to our channel, and check out our Patreon if you want to donate. I'm Scarlet Wit, and you're watching Whitney Vision.